Hello guys and welcome back to the Star Destroyer Oppression. Now today I have a mirror for you. Uh, there's a reason for me mirroring it and that's because it's been taken down. Kraut and T along with Sandre made a very very good video in response to a counter video made to Kraut. And apparently it's not just the left that are special but hurt snowflakes. Since Kraut's video got flagged, and he got a community strike for it. It's a very good video, guys. I really, really suggest that you watch it. It's a bit, little bit long, but it's still a very good video. Take it away, Kraut. Let's delve into some responses by the old right, shall we? And I'll start with something special, a response video by the Alternative Hypothesis, which serves a perfect purpose to showcasing the dishonesty and lack of research that threads itself throughout the old right and their case for race realism. So then what is the point of all of these sources? Who are these sources for? It's clear he hasn't read them. Well, these sources are for people like me, academics, to look at the works of other people, to check and see if what they're saying in the video lines up with what is written in the literature they cite. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, being a chemistry student, that in academia, the amount of studies that is cited by Kraut in his video would only be decent by the standard that I'm used to. It is not at all unusual that in a single chemistry paper you can have 50 other papers cited. It is good to have a lot of sources, not necessarily because some sources may be inaccurate, but because not every useful info is going to be found in a single paper. Sometimes you need to have different sources and a lot of them to make sure that all of what you're saying is covered, whether it is in a video or in a paper. And Crowd is going to give you an example of this. Here's the thing, you, and to some extent I myself, might be used to making videos where we don't have to be constrained by scientific standards and where we can just broadly interpret whatever social phenomena may appear within our political worldview. And in the end, it would suffice to simply post some newspaper articles as a source. However, in STEM, speculation without evidence is nothing but worthless, and there are strict rules to source every single claim that is made. And since these videos are by now made with the help of actual STEM researchers and academics, it comes without saying that I have eventually resigned to put myself under the same standard of work for these videos that they would require and are happy with. In short, that means that the typical anti-social justice video with sources, if existent at all, being some newspaper articles, will not work here. Every claim made on a scientific basis must, under all circumstances, be sourced. And what differentiates sources in STEM from sources one puts forward in politics is that source lists are incredibly long. To quote a Dutch chemistry student who helped me with the work on this video. If I hand in a paper that only has seven sources, people will look at me and ask, is this supposed to be a joke? I will not read it. I advise you to try this yourself. Take your time and stroll through various biology and chemistry papers on asm.org, embopress.org, PubMed, Angevante Chemie, Nature or the US National Library for Medicine. You will find that every paper has 30, 50, or even over a hundred sources. Every little detail must be backed up, not by surveys and social studies, but by cold, hard, lab results. Example from my last video being that I claim in it that there are examples of genes influencing intelligence, that being through dendritic spine density. And to back this up, I posted the links to studies showing how dendritic spine density influences intelligence and also links to studies into genes that have conclusively shown in knockout studies that they influence dendritic spine density in turn. When making any claims about science, it is vital that the claims made are backed by sources, more even than in any other field of research. Therefore, sources will be linked in the description for people who want to fact-check me or to learn more about the topics at hand. Now, let's return to alt-right science man. His accusation is that I merely posted those studies underlying these factors for splash effects and show that I post these sources without having a clue what is in them or even for deceptive means. And this, in the case of this particular video, is really funny. And this will become abundantly clear to you over the course of this video and especially at its end. In one point in the video, he mentions that an effect size in a study in an article he's talking about is so small that it must fall within the margin of error. But if you read the abstract, you'll find that no, there's a positive effect size with a 95% confidence interval in all three of the conditions analyzed. 
I have read that study. The methodology is questionable, the results are questionable, and they even admit to it in that very paper itself. And far more importantly, it is, like all your sources, a genome-wide study. In case you don't know what this means, it means they do not conduct any gene analysis, protein analysis, or any other research that would actually determine the function and expression of genes. Listen, I think I did a good enough job underlying this in the last video, but I'll do it again here for the slow ones. The problem with the study is not with its math. The problem with the study is that it is only math. That there is zero lab work, zero of the research that would make this a biology paper. It's purely mathematical correlations that will not provide results conclusive enough for definitive claims in biology. So the only one who probably didn't read his own sources is Old Right Science Man. But when it comes to sources, I believe there is a far better point at which we can see who is being truly deceptive and dishonest here. The basic problem with Kraut and this Chem Savant 47 guy's criticism is that they don't know what quantitative genetics is. Okay. I'll just read something from the textbook Behavioral Genetics by Robert Plowman. Quote, For complex behavioral traits in the human species, an experiment of nature, twinning, and an experiment of nurture, adoption, are widely used to assess the net effect of genes and environments. The theory underlying these methods is called quantitative genetics. Quantitative genetics estimates the extent to which observed differences among individuals are due to genetic differences of any sort and to environmental differences of any sort without specifying what the specific genes or environmental factors are. Dot, dot, dot. Behavioral genetics uses the methods of both quantitative genetics and molecular genetics to study behavior. And this segment, this segment here, especially the book and the quote, are amazing. So amazing, in fact, that I'm going to show you why this is amazing at the end of this video, rather than now, as the cherry on top of the cake. But if you are impatient, there will be a timestamp where you can jump to see this segment already. You will find it in the description. So let's continue. Apparently, I don't understand what quantitative genetics are, and apparently a PhD research geneticist also doesn't understand what quantitative genetics are. And all types argument in this video of his, basically summarized, is that we do not need all this research stuff that biologists do. We don't need gene expression studies, protein analysis, and knockout studies, and histological research. All that laboratory work that all those scientists do yeah, screw that. All we need is quantitative genetics and psychologists to make conclusions about biology. Right, it's, it's, it's a field, okay? And what these people are doing, Kraut and this chem savant guy, is they're denying either the existence or the validity of an entire field. I mean, often you'll see people saying that their opponents are anti-science, and that's just sort of a you're dumb, I'm smart talking point. But in this regard, I can say that these two goobers are literally against an entire field of research. What alternative hypothesis and the old right doesn't understand is, to quote my friend Sandra, You can only extrapolate from the data the data itself. What this means is that you can't simply look at IQ differences between white and black people and say, oh, that must be because of biology, because there is no biological data in there. Everything you might infer out of the data will require additional data from additional molecular genetic research to be backed up. And so far, I have seen absolutely zero such additional research being done. What Alternative Hypothesis doesn't understand is the difference between a tool and a method in science. A method in science is a means by which a task is completed. A tool in science is a means by which to collect data. Whilst the tool of epigenetic research may provide data such as SNPs that could be related to cognitive ability, that data within itself is inconclusive if further research is not conducted with the methods of molecular biology, such as gene expression, protein analysis, and knockout studies. So here's the bottom line as well as literally the same point I made in the last video. Conduct as many genome-wide association studies as you want. Without further research through the methods of molecular biology, the data will only give you the data, but no confirmation for any interpretations you make and claim to be based within biology. Quantitative genetics is not a field within biology. It's a tool and I'm not dismissing it. I am saying that the data it provides in studies that you and other race realists provide does not comply with the standards required to come 
come to biological conclusions. But at this point, and when it comes to what the alternative hypothesis and from the looks of it, many other race realists think of the work and research biologists conduct, it gets really kind of funny. The notion that you have to find not only the gene, but the effects of the uh, proteins tra transcripted and the metabolic pathways in which they operate and how all that manifests, right? There's a very simple way to know that this is wrong, that you don't have to know this. Humans have domesticated crops and animals for thousands of years, literally without even knowing what a gene is, much less what the specific genes they were manipulating or operating did. Later on in this response to you, Kraut is going to go into much deeper detail as to why what you're saying here regarding quantitative genetics is nonsense. I just wanted to point out here, though, that you're actually trying to compare a controlled environment, which is what you're describing, to the natural process of humans freely choosing who they have offspring with. This is fundamentally intellectually dishonest. You can't do that. Humans are not bred like dogs are bred, for instance. Of course, one can notice certain trends and make certain predictions without knowing specific genes, but the effects of those genes are self-evident. If the effects aren't big enough, you're not going to detect them, and as such, quantitative genetics is just not going to be enough for other smaller effects by genes. And when it comes to SNPs, in most cases, the effects are pretty damn small. Meaning that when it comes to the SNPs of interest in the papers that was cited in the article about race and IQ, the effects would be too small to really detect with the normal conventional means of genetic manipulation that humans have engaged in before genetics was a thing. You don't have to know what a gene is, let alone find the specific genes, to correctly infer that some trait difference is down to a genetic difference. Or, if we don't know what genes are, an innate difference. In order to correctly infer some innate slash genetic difference and make successful predictions and be able to genetically modify plants and animals. Now, let's break this down to show how stupid it is he is literally comparing a controlled environment where we decide the mating habits of plants and animals to the chaotic and unpredictable environment of nature as if they were equal even worse he seems to believe that traits such let's give as an example the size of eggs laid by chicken species are comparable to complex traits such as intelligence thereby setting up a completely false comparison you can breed domesticated animals for specific purposes by observing the results in, for example, how much milk output a cow species has, egg output, meat output, etc., etc. A process of experimentation that is called selective breeding and has been done since the dawn of humankind with domesticated animals and crops. But can you do that for intelligence? And can you do that for human beings? Where's the supposed selective breeding of human beings happening? Where is the selective breeding with the intention of isolating supposedly heritable intelligence traits happening? Intelligence is a complex trait that is substantially influenced by environmental environmental factors. As such, this idea that you can observe heritability of intelligence on the same basis as you can, for example, prove the heritability of variation egg sizes by chickens is frankly ridiculous. Human beings do not have the constrained and controlled breeding patterns of domesticated animals and crops. We have not been bred, as if we were some kind of agricultural produce. We select on our own terms as individuals who we mate with, and have done so since the dawn of mankind. And here's an additional thing which I guess I am repeating, but which is essential since old right science man keeps talking about it, whilst obviously seeming to be unable to understand it. Another thing to consider is this idea that you have to find the genes only came about when the technology to find the genes started to come about. Before this, nobody was demanding that you find the genes in order to infer heritability. So this isn't some universal standard of, of evidence that has always existed and was always required. It's just a convention that came about recently among some of the dumber scientists. You hear that, folks? Alternative Hypothesis honestly thinks that something that is fundamental to genetic research, something that you need to do in order to actually confirm your hypothesis in genetics, is stupid. Nobody was demanding that you find the genes in order to infer heritability. 
So this isn't some universal standard of, of evidence that has always existed and was always required. It's just a convention that came about recently among some of the dumber scientists. And today it's being used as a kind of equality of the gaps. The vast majority of geneticists are fucking morons then, by this logic. But then again, what do you expect from a man who doesn't actually understand genetic research? And today it's being used as a kind of equality of the gaps because factor analysis and admixture studies along with a long-running natural experiment that is human civilization up to this point along with ruling out all sorts of environmental factors that supposedly cause racial IQ differences in IQ and all that entails like poverty and nutrition and stereotype threat and discrimination and stress right ruling all those things out all, all this combined points to divergent evolution happening in humans. It's a plurality of evidence thing along with this being something that you would expect to happen if you just believe in evolution in the first place. Now the molecular genetic stuff is still a little bit new though not as new as it used to be and they're starting to come up with robust and replicable genome-wide association studies that measure the general additive heritability of intelligence, not the non-additive portion, but the additive heritability of intelligence within what are called Western populations. But for now, you can't say as much with molecular genetics as you can with non-molecular genetics. Whilst he is arguing for the superiority of observing selective breeding in his video, he is showing in the background footage of molecular genetic analysis being done in a laboratory. What you are seeing here are Western blots. What you are seeing here is a gel made using gel electrophoresis, a technique based on the concept of chromatography, and this is an analytical technique widely used in molecular biology. This technique can separate mixtures of RNA, DNA, or proteins by pulling them through a block of gel by means of a voltage being put on both sides of the block. For instance, western blotting is seen here in the background, where you label your proteins by introducing them to specific antibodies. Then, under the effect of a voltage, the proteins will separate based on their size and charge, and made visible under the gel by means of a marker, for example fluorescent labeled antibodies. Western blotting can be used to determine the production of a specific protein. The technique was devised in the 80s and has been a fundamental technique in biological research ever since. Without this technique, significant advances in the life sciences, like the production, for example, of insulin by bacteria, might not have been possible. The kind of thing that, according to alt-right science man alternative hypothesis, only dumber scientists do. Yeah. After a segment in which the alt-right science man declares how obsolete, useless, stupid, fallacious and impractical molecular genetic analysis is, the alt-right science man proceeds to a segment praising his amazing alternative that is based on mathematical correlations and supposedly makes molecular genetic analysis obsolete, whilst in the background showing the very molecular genetic analysis which he claims is obsolete and unnecessary. What on earth were you thinking when you edited this video together? Did you really think people would be dumb enough to not realize this? This is stuff that, at least in Germany as far as I know, high school students are taught when they are 17 years old. So you don't even need a biology degree to know this. The dishonest nature of this presentation by alt-right science man speaks for itself. Bashing molecular biology and then presenting a statistical method as superior while in the background showing stock footage images of the very laboratory work that alt-right science man claims is obsolete. Mainly, I believe, because he thought it looks sciency and gave his presentation just the right kind of science man touch. Unbelievable. And this is a theme found throughout this video of alt-right science man responding to me and defending his race realism. A continuous theme of dishonesty, which also shows itself with the lack of sources. But for now, you can't say as much with molecular genetics as you can with non-molecular genetics. For example, I remember back in 2011 when the best molecular genetics estimates for heritability of height was around 10%, whereas the estimates for the heritability of height from the quantitative genetics using the twin studies, those gave you estimates of around 80%. Source, source, give me the fucking source. Isn't it suspicious that the science man who condemns the use of other people's sources to back up their claims doesn't provide sources to his extraordinary claims? 
Human height can be very much determined by environment, but I'm going to get to that. First, let's look at his numbers. Now, according to some studies, you do get an 80% measurement. For instance, there is research done in Australia that reported that the heritability of height was about 80%, which was based on over 3,000 pairs of Australian twins and siblings. In the U.S., another study also found an heritability constant of about 80% for white men. In Finland, another twin study found heritability to be 78% for men and 75% for women. However, this is not consistent with data from around the world. In Asian populations, the heritability of height is much lower than 80%. For instance, in China, a study found a heritability of 65%. And in another study in 1978, in West Africa, it was also found to be 65%. However, it does nothing to counter the fact that if you grow up with malnutrition, you will not grow to be very tall, period. Environment, in the end, has the final word as to how tall you will get. Your genes will not help you if you don't get enough food, for instance. Which brings us to another point as to why these percentages don't really say that much. Why do different populations of a similar genetic background have differing heritability of height? The answer is environmental effects. When a given environment maximizes the genetic potential of any population, this population tends to have a higher heritability for a trait and vice versa. In developed countries, nutrition for childhood development is strong, which maximizes the genetic potential for height, assuming no selection or new mutations. In contrast, in developing countries, nutrition deficits lead to a lower heritability. What all of this means is any percentage of heritability is an oversimplification of a real-world situation. Environment will have the last word. And besides, he is simply wrong here with his previous claim, and I suspect deliberately so. Molecular genetic analysis does not provide any estimates. It provides evidence. Big difference. It provides the actual proof for what is genetic and what not. Molecular genetics serves a very specific purpose within the science of biology. It's the field that goes to the bottom of what is heritable and what is not. It is the fundamental judge of this matter because, as the name suggests, does the research into what genes actually do. It's the science that provides cures and treatments for heritable diseases. It's the science that improves our lives through genetic engineering and it's the science that provides us with insights into who we are by showing and proving what we have inherited genetically. There are no estimates in this field, just evidence through lab results that conclusively prove findings. Yet to alt-right science man, the one and only field of science that could actually show if race realism is true, is nothing but a conspiracy set up to destroy his precious little idea. If you want to prove divergent human evolution, molecular genetics is how to do it. And it is not just a field, it is the field. It's almost like alt-right science man doesn't want actual scientists to look into his ideas. He continues to say that there's this grand series of articles that somehow makes the case for how his methodology is superior and that we are apparently making a mistake of nitpicking this one article of his, supposedly out of context. No, we are not. Molecular genetic evidence is the one and only conclusive method by which heritability of specific traits is tied to a specific gene and conclusively proven or not. And that one part of your article is the only one where you cite actual papers from STEM, which turned out to be non-conclusive and not in support of your case, which you then conclude by saying that conveniently the only scientific field which can either provide or disprove any claims of the heritability of intelligence namely molecular genetics, is somehow unnecessary and wrong. Your entire spiel is to continuously try to attempt to avoid the rigor and inspection by actual science into your claims and by dismissing their methods as dumber scientists, whilst pathetically masquerading yourself in attempts to look scientific with the very scientific methods you rejected in the first place. And this becomes really obvious 11 minutes into the video. And Kemsavon has been saying some pretty stupid stuff 
period. Uh, another argument Chem Savant made that was just kind of weird was about different genes being expressed differently in different cells. But to be quite frank, there are SNPs that exist between different tissues. For example, if I were to take sample tissue from your liver, right, and then take another sample from like muscle and out of your arm or wherever, skeletal muscle tissue or smooth muscle tissue, doesn't fucking matter. You're going to find different SNPs in your liver cells and from your muscle cells. So looking at SNPs within different tissues, so what if you've got different uh, SNPs in different tissues? Because for example, I could have a SNP in my heart that is more prevalent among Asians than it is in white people. And then let's say I've also got a snip in, let's say, one of my, I don't know, my glute muscles or something like that that's more prevalent among blacks. Do I have black booty and then I've got Asian yellow fever heart? I mean, what, what's your example here for how this makes any damn difference? That's within the same person. And I have no idea what any of this is supposed to mean. Cells throughout the body have genes either deactivated or removed outright all the time. He's right. But what this is supposed to be a criticism of, I have no idea. I find it very interesting that you supposedly don't understand what synthetic dissident is actually getting at here. It should be obvious to anyone who's read any basic level of biochemistry or genetics. But let me spell it out for you, alternative hypothesis. Synthetic dissident was simply pointing out that a SNP may have no effect depending on what cell type you're looking at. It really is that simple. I do always find it very interesting how the very same people talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect are usually the ones who are actually afflicted by it. The reason that Synthetic Dissident is mentioning this is because it is one of the biggest reasons as to why genome-wide studies are not nearly as trustworthy as you seem to think they are. They definitely have a place, and they can definitely be useful to find sites of interest in the genetic makeup of individuals. But they are definitely not precise enough to in any way make any determinant statement regarding specific genes. And after that journey through just how much our dear alt-right science man doesn't know, we get into the wonderful conspiratorial part of all of this. What this chem savant guy said, you know, this is what his boss wants to hear, this is what his co-workers want to hear, and it's what the people in charge of giving out grants want to hear. Here we run into a very interesting thought pattern you have regarding academia. It doesn't really work the way you think. Academics, generally speaking, don't give a fuck about political correctness. Yes, of course, if someone were to find that there really was something to racial IQ, genetically speaking, yeah, the media, especially these days, might have a problem with that. There is definitely a political correctness in the media. But there are too many egomaniacs in academia to just let a big finding like that slide. In academia, the dissident opinion that turns out to be correct is a sure way for an academic to become famous and immortalized even. History of science is full of example of mavericks, if you will, who have gone against the stream and made a name for themselves in science because they dare to think differently from other academics. To a large degree, this is even encouraged. Plenty of controversial discoveries in science have been found by individuals who don't care about the opinions of their peers or society at large. They only care about the evidence, and that is the whole point of science. It is supposed to be independent of the culture in which the individual doing the scientific experimentation has been brought up in. Your opinion is just that, an opinion. But the evidence is the evidence, and if there really was something to racial IQ, no amount of political correctness would be able to contain that discovery. But the problem is that unlike Kraut and unlike this guy Synthetic Dissident, which is a name Chem Savant uses on Twitter, these people that I'm getting data from, these are dissidents. And so I can't tell you who they are, but then of course there's a problem. How do you know I'm not just making them up? If your views are dissident, if your scientists are dissident scientists, as this man so boldly proclaims, and they have actual proof that what you are saying is substantial and correct, they would not be dissident views. The moment you come out and say, I have research that disproves how we fundamentally think about something, 
we have thought to be true for the past 100 years, and it survives peer review, you will become the new Einstein, the new Darwin. Because then you will have debunked something that the entire scientific community was not being able to produce over 100 years time. This is why Einstein or Hawking is so well known. Kraut likes to talk about how he's in contact with credentialed experts all the time. And the reality is, so am I. But the thing is, I'm because my views are dissident views, I don't have the freedom to reveal their identities. If you find genes that are directly related to IQ differences, that have a gigantic impact, but they only occur in whites, do you think that medical companies and the entire academic community will give two flying fucks about this? The only way you can fuck up a research conclusion that is controversial is by scientific misconduct. For instance, if you make claims without evidence. So let's say, for instance, that the conclusion of your research is making a discriminatory statement that could be considered racist. But nobody can debunk it. They have no reason to fire you, because then it would be fact. And facts cannot be racist. Trying to fire people for not adhering to your opinion is just bad medicine. Look, Philippe Rushton was the author of the most used intro to psychology textbook, college intro to psychology textbook in Canada at one point. But once he started talking about divergent human evolution, he became a pariah. James Watson was fired from his own institute for having evolutionary thoughts about Africans. Arthur Jensen had to have bodyguards on his campus, and this was back in the 1970s and 80s, for his belief in divergent evolution in humans. Or Larry Summers, who was fired from Harvard for saying that evolution may have played a role in sex differences in math and science. Bruce Lawn did some work on a gene that varied by race that had to do with the brain. I forget the specific what is something encephalus something. But he abandoned that line of research after all sorts of threats and being advised to, to abandon the research in order to save his career. The examples alt-right science man gives for his dissident scientists that need protection are actually rather funny. One of them is James Watson, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking research into DNA, however was fired in 2007. Now, alt-right science man claims he was fired for producing work and looking into divergent human evolution and race. However, when you look into it, a completely different image emerges of an acclaimed scientist who at some point seems to have completely lost his marbles. Starting in the year 2000, when he claimed that there is a connection between exposure to sunlight and sexual urges and that melanin has consequently made dark-skinned people more sexually active, saying at one point that melanin is better than Viagra because you don't have to think about sex. Who knew that race realists are that woke? Now, all of that is a bold claim to make. He must have conducted quite a bit of research to come to this conclusion. And guess what? He did do research, and he even presented it when he made that claim. I kid you not, he showed an image of a sad-faced Kate Moss as evidence for his claim to a packed lecture hall. His final downfall came in 2007 after an interview with the Sunday Times newspaper in which he asserted that intelligence differences between Africans and non-Africans were genetic without providing any kind of biological research, only just assertions. Lawrence Summers is an economist, so I have to ask why alt-right science man even mentions him in the first place, especially when you keep in mind that Lawrence Summers argued over points of the biological basis of gender differences, and there's absolutely nothing that ties him in any way to race realism. Rushton and Jensen are so full of shit and pseudoscientific gibberish, they deserve their own videos in the near future. And one particularly funny person who isn't directly shown in this video, but repeatedly appears wherever alt-right science man appears, is Davide Piffer. What Piffer consistently produces is the same stuff we have seen before. He's a psychologist and his papers on the matter are all mathematical correlations without any actual molecular genetic analysis. Particularly funny is his blog, complaining about the fact and whining that scientists rejected his correlations as proof of genetic causation for racial IQ differences, and where he goes so far as to whine that the process of peer review and examination by scientists should be replaced with a popular vote. To put this short and in summary for all of you, STEM science is not a democracy. It is an absolutely strict meritocracy. 
And concerning Bruce Lam, a simple search through his work will reveal that he basically did the same thing that alt-right science man did, which is make claims on the basis of mathematical correlations without further molecular genetic research. He did research on something encephalo something, microcephalin, a gene that expresses itself in fetal brain development, in particular on two alleles which appeared to correlate with two significant developments in human civilization, that being the emergence of the agricultural revolution and the emergence of writing. Finding that these alleles are less common amongst Africans, he argued that this was evidence for a racial genetic difference in cognitive ability, however also fell short of doing any molecular genetic analysis to either prove or disprove that correlation and therefore got a tap on his fingers. Go and look up the paper in question yourself, you will find a complete mess which doesn't list its methodology but links it behind a paywall. In a paper by the way the methodology is the means and tools with which the research was done. So in essence what is missing in his paper is the means and work that led to his conclusions. It's just the conclusions without any research. Even better, the tap on his fingers came from within his own profession as subsequent biologists who actually did the required research found, quote, we show that models of human history that include both population growth and spatial structure can generate the observed patterns without selection. We genotype these variants in 9,000 children and find no meaningful associations with brain size and various cognitive measures, which indicates that contrary to previous speculations, ASPM and MCPH1 have not been selected for brain-related effects. Now that's beautiful. Wonderful. You see that contrary to previous speculations part? That's basically a scientist bitch slapping another scientist who made a mistake. And to summarize, the papers prove that there was no divergent evolution concerning these genes. If you want to see another wonderful scientific bitch slap, you can read the ongoing adaptive evolution of ASPM and microcephalin is not explained by increased intelligence yourself. Or to save the best for last, in 2010, Mark Trimborn conducted a mutation study that determined that the gene in question, MCPH1, does not affect brain size in the way Bruce Lahn claimed. Bruce Lahn is not some dissident scientist who was persecuted for supposed wrong think. Bruce Lahn was simply wrong, mainly due to his own insufficient work, and was consequently embarrassed when other scientists willing to do that work proved him wrong. These differences in environment produced obvious genetic differences between the races. Why assume identical brains? You could say that because Africa was harsher than Europe, that Africans must be more genetically predisposed to intelligence, however we operationalize that. And their smaller brains, in fact, have more tightly packed neurons or they're more efficient or something like that. Now, I don't think so, but that would be a far more plausible argument than equal or whatever. I think that modern industrial civilization comes from a population that evolved first with farming in winter. If you're in an area that's so cold that you can't farm, that's a whole different set of cognitive traits. Inuits actually have the physically largest brains of any separable group, and thus probably the most neurons but their cognitive abilities, at least so far, haven't translated to economic success in modern economies or into high scores on modern IQ tests. The idea is that farming in winter requires planning and develops a set of cognitive abilities that leads to more complex economies than the cognitive traits required to survive in a desert do. And here we get to a very interesting point in the video, ladies and gentlemen. Let's counter his point here regarding Inuits, white people, and Asians, and how they supposedly have a bigger brain size than the other so-called races. First of all, let me just say that there is actually some truth to this claim. We do know, for instance, that Africans actually do have smaller brains on average than people in other parts of the world. An obvious explanation to this could be malnutrition, because guess what, a lot of African countries have a lack of food. Varying levels of lead poisoning, which is quite common in Africa, is another cause. Also, a lack of proper schooling is another explanation. However, what is another reason as to why Inuits, Northern Asians, and Northern Europeans have bigger brains on average than the other so-called races? Well, 
you got to keep in mind that when I say Northern Europeans, for instance, I do mean Northern Europeans and not Southern Europeans. So even within the same so-called race, you know, white people, there seems to be a difference here. And there is. However, one of the explanations as to why this is is surprisingly simple, and it very much shows just how little alternative hypothesis actually understands of the topic that he's talking about. Not only do Inuits, Europeans, and Asians in the North have bigger brains, but they also have bigger eyeballs. In fact, all people living in or are native to the northern latitudes have bigger brains and eyeballs. This is explained in a paper from 2011 by the University of Oxford. They explain that the farther that human populations live from the equator, the bigger their brains. However, it turns out that this is not because they are smarter, but because they need a bigger vision area of the brain to cope with the low light levels experienced at high latitudes. What they found essentially was that areas with dull gray cloudy skies and long winters are places where people evolved bigger eyes and brains so they could visually process what they see. The human brain needed to compensate for the low light levels at high latitudes, and it's indicated by the fact that actual visual sharpness measured under natural daylight conditions is constant across latitudes, which suggests that the visual processing system has adapted to the ambient light conditions as human populations have moved across the globe. Now, the study took into account a number of potentially confounding effects, including the effects of phylogeny, the evolutionary links between different lineages of modern humans, the fact that humans living in higher latitudes are physically bigger overall, and the possibility that the eye socket volume was linked to cold weather and the need to have more fat around the eyeball by way of insulation. But it gets even better because this is something we see in the Neanderthals too. A Neanderthal man who was an early cousin to Homo sapiens evolved during the Ice Age and had a bigger brain than any of modern humans. Again, this is most likely due to the fact that they needed to see properly in the low light levels. Since the Neanderthals evolved at higher latitudes as well, and also had bigger bodies than us modern humans, more of the Neanderthal brain would have to have been dedicated to vision and body control, which leaves less of the brain to deal with other functions like social networking, for instance. Despite the bigger brain size of Neanderthals, I think it's pretty safe to say, though, that they probably were not as intelligent as us modern humans. For instance, they didn't make nearly as complicated tools, nor did they ever invent agriculture. Now, these findings alone do show that the idea that all type is pushing here, you know, that brain size is in any way correlated to actual cognitive function, intelligence, is nothing but bunk. It is nonsense. But it gets even better, because according to his own reasoning, Black people should actually be better at decision-making than white people. Let me explain. According to a study from 2010, it was found that the orbitofrontal cortex was actually bigger in African Americans than in Caucasians. And the difference is actually somewhat substantial. For those who don't know, the orbitofrontal cortex deals with quick decision-making. In other words, black people should be way better at stockbroking than white people. Of course, I'm not actually suggesting this. The sample size of this particular study is very low, but it is actually quite funny how you can use the very same logic that all type is using to disprove his own point. How, according to his own reasoning, black people are actually the ubermensch. It should also be noted, though, that in this study, there was no real difference in total gray matter and total white matter noticed between the so-called races. Which brings us to another important point. One should never confuse the brain volume with the actual brain matter. People can have different volumes of their brain, but it doesn't mean that they have actual more brain matter. Yet another thing that all type doesn't seem to understand. And now, for the last part of this video, as I have announced at the start, I have something special. Something for which we have to return to the start. Do you remember the book quote from the beginning of this video? 
for complex behavioral traits in the human species, an experiment of nature twinning and an experiment of nurture adoption are widely used to assess the net effect of genes and environments. The theory underlying these methods is called quantitative genetics. Quantitative genetics estimates the extent to which observed differences among individuals are due to genetic differences of any sort and to environmental differences of any sort without specifying what the specific genes or environmental factors are. Da, da, da. Behavioral genetics uses the methods of both quantitative genetics and molecular genetics to study behavior. Now, after gathering the research for this video together with a group of academics and thinking I was done with all the research, I watched his video again to find any potential mistakes I made and got hooked on this part. Dot dot dot. What does that dot 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 stand for? Da, da, da. What is missing here? A paragraph? Two paragraphs? An entire page or even more? Now. Since it's missing and you might assume alt-right science man is honest, it must be something completely insignificant to the subject at hand. Right? Is it? I got hooked on that, so screw it, I bought the book and read it and found what was missing. And it was just one single sentence. Quote, when heredity is important, and it almost always is for complex traits like behavior, it is now possible to identify specific genes by using the methods of molecular genetics, the topic of chapter 9. You literally cut out the part of that quote that disproves your point. And it gets even better because why stop here? So I read the entire 500 pages of this book. The book by Robert Plomin is a summary of the methods used by psychiatrists and psychologists like himself to make estimates on the heritability of behavioral traits. In chapter 2 we get an overview of Mendel's laws of heritability, in particular giving us an example of Huntington disease and how Mendel's law of heritability can be used to make predictive models that attest to a 50% chance of offspring having Huntington disease. And here it underlines that in the end, however, the only conclusive way of determining if a child has inherited the disease is through testing, the kind of testing done through the methods of molecular genetics. And this same pattern repeats itself throughout the book, the author describing how statistical analysis can provide prediction models, but that molecular genetical analysis in the end has the final say and is the method that provides conclusive evidence or disproves the predictions. On page 18 in the same chapter, we find an in-depth explanation as to why identification of specific genes, as well as protein analysis through methods of molecular genetic analysis, is the most important part of research into heritability, whilst the tools of epigenetics merely provide calculations for predictions that then have to be either proven correct or false by the methods of molecular genetic research. Chapter 3, Beyond Mendel's Law, at page 29 on cognitive ability, is really special. It underlines that transmission of general cognitive ability does not seem to follow simple Mendelian rules of heredity, as pointed out before, because it's not observed within a control environment, and that the tools of quantitative genetics can merely provide mathematical correlations, as well as candidate genes for further research. To summarize for the slower ones amongst you what this means, this chapter in essence debunks what alt-right science men said about the supposed benefits of observing selective breeding for conclusions on cognitive ability in the very video in which he supposedly cites this book as supporting his case. The entire chapter 4, DNA, the basis of heredity, is about the importance of molecular genetic research in this field of psychology. Quote, However, it is important to understand the biological mechanisms underlying heredity for two reasons. First, understanding the biological basis of heredity makes it clear that processes by which genes affect behavior are not mystical. Second, this understanding is crucial for appreciating the exciting advances in attempts to identify genes associated with behavior. The importance of analyzing DNA sequences, gene mapping with chromosomes, and, you know, all that laboratory work that according to alt-right science man only dumber scientists do. 
In chapter 5, Animal Models in Behavioral Genetics at page 65, we read that the correlations made with experimental breeding groups are merely just correlations if without gene knockout studies, gene silencing and research into gene expression. You know, all that stuff that the dumber scientists do. In chapter 8, the interplay between genes and environment covering animal models, adoption studies, twin studies and DNA studies concludes in summary on page 127 with the vital importance of identifying the genes for further molecular genetic research and that epigenetics provides merely candidate genes for such research. The entire chapter 9 titled Identifying the Genes. Now this is coming from a guy that doesn't know what quantitative genetics is and has a really stupid find the genes dogma. Is about this important process. Yes, this book which the alt-right science man uses, claiming that it supports his claims that we don't need to find genes to provide evidence, has an entire chapter about how important it is to find the genes. A really stupid find the genes dogma. Specifically on identifying candidate genes through the tools of epigenetics for the all-important molecular genetic research. Then the entire chapter 10, Pathways Between Genes and Behavior, summarizes and puts emphasis on the importance of molecular molecular genetic research, goes more in depth describing protein analysis, transcription, gene expression, impact on the brain, the understanding of how genes impact the physiology of the living system, and all of that takes center stage, as it is through these methods that an actual real link is either proven or disproven between specific genes and behavior, ergo heritability. Chapter 10, one of the biggest and most detailed in the book, gives an in-depth explanation of why the methods of molecular genetics, or how old right science man calls it, dumber scientists, is the single most important part of any research into genetic ties to behavior. The mathematical correlations brought forward as the result of epigenetic research are on their own pointless without preceding molecular genetic analysis. You can read more in chapter 11 about research into genes tied to cognitive disabilities and diseases such as Down syndrome, dementia or other with emphasis on the importance on finding genes for further analysis on page 185 for example and how epigenetic research merely provides suggestions and candidate genes whilst molecular genetic research methods provide the actual evidence. Cognitive ability, the ties between intelligence and heritability, the role of environment, interaction between nature and nurture, and the importance of identifying genes for actual conclusive research and analysis with the methods of molecular genetics. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this book has an entire chapter dedicated to the alt-right's favorite race realism pet, intelligence and its heritability. By the way, showing how the alt-right is full of shit, a chapter that alt-right science man conveniently forgets about. Even more, it goes into specific cognitive abilities in chapter 13, aka IQ test performance and their potential heritability. And also here at page 228, we find that it underlines that fine Finding the genes for further molecular genetic analysis is of the most major importance. A really stupid find the genes dogma. Specific cognitive disabilities such as schizophrenia, personality and social psychology such as parent-offspring relationships, peer relationships, romantic relationships, sexual orientation, self-esteem, attitude and interests, behavioral economics, personality disorders like schizotypal personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder and criminal behavior. With all these examples chapter by chapter given you will find a very specific detailed summary on how the most important part is that the tools of epigenetics merely provide suggestions for genes and that in the end the identification of the genes and the further analysis through the methods of molecular genetics is of the most significant importance. To put it short and bluntly, alt-right science man, the alternative hypothesis, took the academic work of a renowned psychologist and lied about it to make it look as if that psychologist were some sort of supporter of his little alt-right science man pseudoscience race realism. Besides being completely dishonest, this is also highly unethical. Robert Plowman, throughout the entirety of his book, makes it very clear that quantitative genetics can merely provide candidate genes for further molecular genetic research, and that it is molecular genetic research that in the end will provide evidence for 
if specific genes are responsible for behavioral traits suspected to be heritable. An alt-right science man took his work and lied by omission to make it look as if Robert Plowman was saying the exact opposite. Not only lying about his case and attempting an appeal at authority fallacy, but also potentially besmirching the good name of an academic researcher for the purpose of furthering his own pseudoscientific racist agenda. In the end, I highly recommend to the entire audience to go and buy and read the book themselves because ironically it confirms everything I said in this video and in the video before and I especially recommend buying the book and reading it to all the morons screeching that I am wrong and to pay special attention to chapter 9 titled identifying the genes which is literally about finding the genes and how important that is a really stupid find the genes dogma a little update at the end as you noticed throughout this video this video was mainly a collaboration with the Swedish chemistry student Sandra, who also runs his own YouTube channel covering similar topics. I will leave links in the description and I highly recommend you go and watch some of his videos. And with the Dutch chemistry student Zabi, who I am trying to talk into opening up his own YouTube channel. Also with the awesome geneticist Synthetic Dissident, to whose Twitter I will link in the description, and a British biochemist who also helped substantially with the research for this video, and I will link to her Twitter in the description as well. They are all part of a small group of people that has assembled itself over the past months of academics and students helping me and other youtubers get a better understanding of biology starting out humble we by now have an american geneticist a swedish chemistry student a dutch chemistry student a dutch molecular biologist a british biochemist a portuguese anthropologist and a few more with whom we have gathered together to research these topics and admittedly often just shoot the shit in calls and chats if you wish to join our conversations feel free to join a discord server to which i will link in the description and i have no idea what any of this is supposed to mean